Welcome to Science It Out, a live science quiz show brought to you by MIT students. I'm joined here today by Mason, Jordan, and Chloe, and we're going to try out this new science quiz show. How it works is I'm going to be asking them a bunch of fun science trivia from recent news and see how much they know. Because we should know a lot, right? Because we're all MIT grad students. <laughs> maybe, maybe. All right, we'll see. And we'll get a chance to meet them as well. So between all the questions, we'll do mini interviews with all of them to learn what they're doing at MIT, what they're studying, and what their project is. So yeah, you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. All right, so when I ask the question, you guys are going to ring in, and whoever rings in first gets a chance to answer. And if you get it wrong, we'll go to the next person who ran, ran in. All right? Cool. All right. Question number one. In 2016, two researchers used blank as a unique method to help pass kidney stones. Yes, Chloe. Um, electromagnetic? No, no, just kidding. That's wrong. <laughs> it's far less complex than that. Kidney yeah. stones. I can give you guys a hint. Uh, a hint. Oh, this oh, oh. <laughs> yes. Roller coasters. Yes. Oh. yes that is correct. <laughs> Did you know that one? Uh, it was my second choice. Yes. Okay, yeah, so these researchers actually used roller coasters. So obviously they didn't like find people with kidney stones and throw them onto roller coasters. They had a model that they could simulate kidney stones. But yeah, they literally went to Disney World with these models, ran them through the roller coasters, I think 30 different times. And they found that sitting in the back of the roller coaster is the best place you want to sit if you want to dislodge your kidney stones. So is that like better than what they do now? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't think there was a control. I don't know. I didn't look at the study that closely. But this study did win the 2018 Ig Nobel Prize. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Do you guys know what the Ig Nobel is? Yeah. They, yeah. they did one with where they put sticks on the back of chickens to see how dinosaurs would walk. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the whole point is science that seems silly but is actually yeah useful. unusual yeah. research. Yeah. All right. So next time you get a kidney stone, we'll go to Six Flags. <laughs> All right. We can also go to Six Flags. Just in general. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Question number two. Earlier in the month, a report came out that says the U.S.'s blank in 2018 had the biggest increase in eight years. Yes. Chloe? Research funding? Sadly, really? no. I was about to <laughs> <laughs> there was an increase in NIH funding. So, maybe not in the last, NS, NS in the last 30 days. <laughs> oh, well, no, uh, no. Yeah, maybe. No. Um, <laughs> our blank had increased the most in eight years? Yeah. What has increased? In, it's not a good thing. Oh. Uh, yes. Global temperatures? That's, the US it's getting, global temperatures? It's, it's getting closer. It's getting closer. You're in the right. Yeah. Sea levels? Yeah, I'll give it, uh, well, not let's see, sea levels. I thought you said CO2 levels. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. All right, I'll okay. give okay. you guys all a point because you all guessed. Yeah, uh, So <laughs> it's carbon emissions where it uh, grew by 3.4%. Um, um, they think it's correlated with economic growth uh, with all the different businesses that are booming. There's more and more businesses using carbon emissions, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Question number three. Question number three. The blank mission has discovered eight new planets and six supernovas so far. Oh, I know nothing about space. Ooh, this is not um, me. Uh, the yes. test mission? Yes, the test mission. For extra credit, can you tell me what test stands for? The Transiting Exoplanet Satellite Survey? Or yes. Survey satellite? Good job. So when I was researching this question, I actually had to keep updating how many planets they were finding. <laughs> I think originally when I wrote this question, it was three, and I just checked, and, and eight? well, eight was like two days ago, so wow. this number might be outdated because it's a two-year study. It's actually led at MIT. Do you know anyone in your department that's doing anything like yeah, this? Yeah, there are a few students in the MIT who are looking at exoplanets using test data, so it's very topical. The yeah, they're expected to find 20,000 expo exoplanets over the next two years. Yep. Wow. Yeah, and for our viewers at home, do you want to define what an exoplanet is? So an exoplanet is very similar to planets in our solar system. They're just found outside of our solar planet, so that's why they're called exoplanets. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. And we're going to segue straight into our first interview. We have Mason here. All right, Mason, where are you originally from? So I'm originally from New Zealand, but I've grown up in New Zealand and, sorry, in Singapore and Australia as well. 
All right, how does the weather compare there compared to, I guess, what we have outside <laughs> now? So, it does get really snowy in New Zealand, but that's uh -huh. not where I'm from. I'm from the slightly warmer part of New Zealand. Okay. Uh, and also being from Singapore, it means I'm more used to warmer weather. Uh, but I'm right now, the snow is very novel to me. Mm -hmm. So it's very fun because I get to walk <laughs> around and I get to crush snow. And uh -huh. the slipperiness around Boston hasn't really uh, annoyed me that much. All right, let us fun. know when that becomes less fun. Because <laughs> pretty sure after a couple of years here. Next week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you study at MIT? So I study physics at MIT. Yeah, so I'm uh, specializing in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know you're just a first year, but do you have any idea what you want your eventual project or research or just any general field you're interested in studying yeah. in your graduate school career? So I came into MIT wanting to study neutron stars. So these mm -hmm. are stars about the size of Manhattan, wow. but they are about a million, billion, a million, trillion, trillion kilograms. So they're very heavy, very dense. And this means that you need to use Einstein's general theory of relativity, which oh. tells you how space warps around objects. Okay. And you also need to incorporate quantum mechanics, which is the study of the very small. And physicists do not know yet how to combine these two things. Mm -hmm. So I believe that neutron stars are a way to unify these two theories. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very exciting uh, thing to study. All right, we'll look for your research in a couple of years. Uh, what else do you do at MIT or do outside of MIT that's so, not research? So at MIT, I, um, I'm also the part of AstroGazers. So what we do is that we take a bunch of telescopes out into the MIT community or into the public. And we just share the wonders of the night sky with the public. So uh, objects like the moon or Venus or Saturn. Uh, and it, it's really fun. It's, especially when kids come along, they get very excited because it's their first time seeing uh, objects through a telescope. And it's just a great time. And Ali can tell you more about it because she's Yeah, as someone session. who does know, like, doesn't know anything about astronomy, it's really cool to look through the telescope and see Saturn and be like, oh my gosh, I can see the rings on Saturn. So yeah, viewers, look out for the telescope set around MIT. And I think we're, you guys are planning on going around other places in Cambridge as well. Yeah, that's right. All right. And what else do you do outside of MIT for fun when you're not? So I like visiting museums. So I just came back from DC a few weeks ago nice. on the holiday mm -hmm. and I visited a lot of museums and a lot of memorials. And it's just, it's just fun in general, mm -hmm. but also really nice to know about American history, especially being in a country that I've not been in before. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I haven't been around the museums in Boston and I really should and I feel really guilty about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, the Museum of Fine Arts and the JFK Library, mm -hmm. really want to go on those, the Freedom Tree as well. Um, but otherwise, if I'm not in the lab, uh, I'm just working out, yeah, just mm -hmm. making sure that I have this healthy work-life balance. Yeah. yeah, always really good to have. All right, thank you, Mason. And we're going to get back into some questions now. And I think this is my favorite question that I came across. Mm. Um, all right. And all right, so question number four. A company recently revealed an $1,800 treadmill as what? As the target user. Yeah, Jordan. Horses? Not horses, but you're, I like the way you're thinking. This is like um, on the right track. Those are usually when treadmills get expensive. <laughs> we have one in my lab in undergrad. For horses? <laughs> nice. Is it a horse-like creature? It is not human. Oh, well, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> is it a sea creature? It is not a sea creature. It is a creature people um, often have in their homes. Chloe. Dogs? Not dogs. Mason. Cats. Yes, cats. <laughs> wow. The treadmill is called the little cat. And how do you guys want to give a guess about how they actually get the cats to run on this treadmill? I was actually wondering the same thing. Did uh, they put like catnip at the front? No, what they did is they had a strip of LEDs at the end that flashed mm -hmm. so it looks like a laser pointer. Yeah. Mm. So the cat will just like continue to run <laughs> and try to get at the laser pointer. Sounds very, very, very much like, like Sisyphus rolling rolling that stone up the Yeah. yeah. Not, not fun for the cat, but... No. I feel like a cat will like give up after a while. They would like figure out like what was going on and be like, no, yeah. this well, is... Well, A, your cat would jump in the box. And they'll yeah. never leave the box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'll be like, this is an $1,800 <laughs> treadmill I like, wow. for you. <laughs> All right. Next question. Question number five. A recent study estimates that nearly 19% of adults think they have blank, but actually less than 11% actually do. Is it a medical condition? Yes. Mason. Allergies. Correct. Food allergies. 
So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you guys, do any of you guys have food allergies? I have um, hay fever, but that's about it. That's not food. You're not eating the hay. Well. But, yeah, so only less than 11% of adults actually have food allergies. The other people who think they might have a food allergy likely have a food intolerance. Mm-hmm. So the difference is an allergy is actually like your immune system reacting, overreacting to a food, whereas an intolerance is where your stomach doesn't like digest it that well. So it's, it's like the difference between anaphylaxis and like and um, lactose intolerance, where you get mm-hmm. sick to your stomach or something. Yeah, pretty okay. much. And you yeah. guys know what the most common food allergy in the U.S. is? Tree nuts. Nope. I was surprised at this too. I thought it was hmm. peanuts. It's not. Huh. Seafood? Yeah, shellfish. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think they said, mm-hmm. yeah, I think this is like 17 or no, 17% of food allergies were shellfish oh, allergies wow. or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. All right. I'm marking down the score. All right. Number six. Although there might be some pushback from lawmakers, Google and GM want to remove what car part from their respective self driving cars? Hmm, is it an engine? It is not an engine. I think they still need that, even though we have no one driving. The steering wheel. Yes, it is the steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so they're thinking of removing the steering wheel, and along with the steering wheel, also the brake and the gas pedal. Um, their argument for okay. removing it <laughs> is that they don't want their users to panic when something's happened and just grab it and like steer the car off its course. But obviously, the, I feel like on, there's so many other. But the on the other side, people. That. Yeah, and on the other side, people are worried that like, well, what if something happens and I need to have control over the self-driving car? Can't and you just lock the, the steering wheel? I know these are the debates that we're gonna have to have when like these become more and more common. I think it, I think it makes sense. I, I see people panicking, and maybe the the car is gonna have a better idea of how to get out of the trouble than the the person. But hopefully. I was about to say, I'd like to see the car, I'd like to see proof that the car can get out of trouble better than the person does. Yeah. Before we start taking the steering wheel out of the car. That's fair. Fair. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot of research and a lot of studies going on right now trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on to our next interview. Jordan, you want to jump into the hot seat? Sure. All right, do a bit of a switcheroo here. All right. Okay. So, Jordan, where are you from? I am from New Jersey. So not too far from here. Not too far, same climate, so the snow is pretty normal for me. (laughs) (laughs) And what do you currently study at MIT? I study medical engineering and medical physics with a focus on electrical engineering and computer science. So I'm interested in medical devices and then ethical artificial intelligence for healthcare. You want to talk a little more about that, the ethical, like what are the kind of issues surrounding that and the kind of things you might want to study? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of issues surrounding data privacy, making sure that people's data is protected while we analyze it, and then making sure that the data that you have accurately reflects the people that you're trying to use the program on, um, Mm -hmm. because programs can be wrong if you have like a ton of data from one population and not a ton of data on another population. So keeping that in mind when you develop AI for medicine is something that's really important to me. All right, that's really interesting. I can't wait to kind of, with like AI and like machine learning and all these like kind of big data things coming out more and more, I'd be really interested to see, like, yeah, like people are really excited about the potential of all this like innovation, but you have to start thinking about the ethics and yeah, it's good to see that someone is thinking about (laughs) it. And so yeah, what else do you do at MIT? At MIT, I work with the Grad Student Council, um, generally in science policy outreach, so artificial intelligence ethics and policy mm-hmm. and legislation is one of the things that I'm really passionate about through that. Um, and yeah, and then working with my department to just plan like social events, things like that. Mm-hmm. And in your free time, like cause we get tons of free time as grad students, uh, what do you like to do? <laughs> so I do a lot of science communication work, um, also in AI ethics. So I have a YouTube channel that focuses on that. And then I do Um, a lot of writing for different media outlets on that topic and then also like the gym and reading books and sleep. (laughs) You should have told us about our YouTube channel ahead of time. We'd like flash it at the bottom and be like, check out, (laughs) click here to subscribe. (laughs) Just point down to the bottom. All right, that's really awesome. All right, thanks so much for taking the interview and we're back to our regularly scheduled programming with even more questions. Starting with question number seven. In early January, blank became the first country to land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. China. 
Yes. <laughs> you beat Mason to it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so the, what is it, the Chain E-4 mission uh, launched in early December, and it took the spacecraft supposedly three days to travel to the moon, where it spent the last few weeks in orbit preparing to touch down on the crater. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently landing on the far side of the moon is tricky because the there's no direct way to communicate the spacecraft as it nears its target. Something that like sounds that. right, but I'm not 100% sure. On that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> look, all, like the research I was reading was saying that like the kind of like blocks it, and so you're just kind of like landing blind. Mm. And so it's pretty exciting because I haven't explored like that area a lot. So mm. we'll see what cool pictures we get back from that. Yeah, cool. Awesome. All right, number eight. In 2014, a group of researchers asked players to identify songs as fast as possible. They found that the catchiest song that people were able to recognize was in about 2.3 seconds, way below the average of 5 seconds. What song was this? I'm sorry, I'm going to get a bunch of songs stuck in your head now. Uh, <laughs> I think we might need some hints on this one. There's just the catalog of songs. Yeah, uh, I think like 90s. World? 90s. I think 90s. Uh, 90s British pop. Oh, British pop. Hmm. Mm. Ooh. Oh, man. Oh, this is tough. Yeah. Uh, there's an American pop event named Britney Spears. Well, like, it, it, was, <laughs> it was mainstream in the US. I remember having like a Barbie. Yes? Factory Boys want to Are they British? I don't know. No, I don't think they are. <laughs> oh, okay. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oasis Wonderwall. Nope. Oh. Mm. It's, a it's a girl band. <gasps> Spice Girls. Mmm. I don't know the name of the song, but it's somewhere yeah. they go. So tell me what you want. What you yeah, really yeah. Want. who's gonna get the name of the song first? Uh, uh, now it's all stuck in your heads. <laughs> We're MIT students. We don't know Spice Girls. <laughs> the viewers no, are no, shouting no. at us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I, I was about to say I know exactly what song this is, but I have no idea. Yeah. what song this is. <laughs> all right, I'll give it to you guys. It's Wannabe. Uh, 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 yeah. Okay. Anyone want to get a crack at the second most? Catchiest song they found in this research? It's gonna take us a little bit. Is it also minutes. a 90s British pop song? <laughs> no, it is not. Actually, okay. I don't really know when this came out because I'm really bad with music history. Yeah. I'll just give it to you guys. It's Mambo number five. Oh, oh yeah. Makes okay. sense. That's like late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. Think. Yeah. Cool. So, thank So, you're welcome. All those songs <laughs> are now stuck in your head. Yep. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Number nine Dutch astronaut Andre Kupers? Can't, sorry if I pronounced your last name incorrectly because you're totally watching. Uh, <laughs> revealed that he accidentally blanked from the International Space Station. He did this a long time ago, but he recently like admitted in reports he accidentally did this from the International Space Station. Hmm. You have a space name. Yes. Did he accidentally puke? No. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I want to say it had something to do with him doing a spacewalk. It was not about space. It was actually more related to, let's say, communications. Mm. Something with a phone. Yes. Butt dial? You can't butt dial for someone from the ISS, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you're getting close. You're getting, <laughs> you're getting close. You're getting close. He did accidentally make a phone call that he didn't mean to make. Who did he call this? What, what, like? <laughs> what do you do in case of emergencies? He called. He called like nine one one. Yeah, he ISS. called nine one one from ISS. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. Accidentally. <laughs> Accidentally. Because space. like apparently, even in the International Space Station, you need to dial nine to get out. Oh. oh. And he just misdialed. Why? <laughs> I, I don't know. Why? Yeah. Can you call in? I don't. I don't think you can call in. Someone asked that. Yeah. Or can you call like within? The space, like, are I don't there? Know. I don't know. I guess we'll have to go up there and <laughs> yeah, give it a no. try. <laughs> That's but, yeah. Apparently, the operator, like, it, the call went through, and apparently, the operator picked up, picked up, and was like, "What is your emergency?" And he was like, uh, "I'm in space." <laughs> 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 like, All come right. Down now? All right. I'll give it to Jordan because you were close on that one. All right. Or we know did you? I'll give you both a point. Cool. See, points clearly do not matter. Light work, light work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a, it's, a team, it's a team effort here, right? It's not really a competition. It's all about working together. Mm. All right. Let's see. All right. Number 10. England 
often struggles with a sewer problem called fatberg. What is a fatberg? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> hmm. In only England. I guess okay, I've never heard of this before, so maybe this is just a problem they have over there in England. Does it have something to do with the age problem. of the sewer system? Or? Maybe. Yeah. Hmm. Or maybe we have it here, we just don't call it Fatberg. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's might be one of those English terms. Mm. Uh. Does it have to do with like sewer backup or something? Yeah, I'll give it to you. So, okay. a Fatberg is a congealed lump in a sewer system oh. formed by a combination of non-biodegradable solid matter, such as wet wipes with grease or cooking fat. Oh, yummy. Were the two examples that were given Fantastic. in this article. Apparently, uh, they reported there was a monstrous clump lurking beneath the town of Sidmouth in Devon, measuring 210 feet, making it longer than the height of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Wow. Wow. Don't, don't flush your wet wipes, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't want to be the plumber who has to go and be like, oh, okay, guys. Say, I don't know if that's a plumber at that point. Poor Mario shows up. You need a no. deity at that point. <laughs> yeah. All right. Chloe, you want to jump into the hot seat and get yes. interviewed? Yes, ma'am. All right. Hello, Chloe. How are you? Hello. I'm doing well. Where are you from? I am from Tucson, Arizona. So much warmer than here. Much warmer. I went to undergrad at New York University, so oh, okay. I'm a little used to the cold. So you got Boston. transitioned. Boston's like a step up, though. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully you're used to it by now. So Fair. what do you study at MIT? So my background's in biology, but I actually um, am getting my degree in biological chemistry. I'm a second year in the PhD program right now. Nice. And do you have an idea where your project, your research is going, or do you have an idea like what you want to study? Yeah. So I actually study a protein involved in um, HIV transmission, and um, it basically it's the protein responsible for fusing the HIV virion to the human cell. Mm. So I'm interested in the structure and function of that um, protein. Okay. And so like. If you have like unlimited money and time, like what ideally what would you see the end point of your research being? Like what would be the I'd love to get a full structure and maybe move into vaccine development. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I'm just like a a small piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I wanna just do whatever I can to help people mm -hmm. down the road make effective vaccines. Yeah. That's yeah. really great. And what else do you do at MIT? So I'm mostly involved in science policy work and science outreach. So I work with the Graduate Student Council. I'm vice chair of our external external affairs board, so I um, liaise with different um, federal and state governments and also I go to some Cambridge City Council meetings every once in a while so shout out yeah yeah <laughs> hopefully some of you guys are watching now <laughs> and what do you like to do outside of MIT outside of school so I love hiking in the White Mountains mm -hmm. um, I snowshoe this time of year obviously okay. um, and then I also like to watercolor paint nice mm -hmm. what's your favorite painting you've done so far Oh man, I paint a lot of birds. I did Ooh. like a really nice blue jay once, and that's that's still my, my pride and joy. Yeah. Mostly it's a lot of abstract stuff though. That's really cool. It's always nice to kind of get away from the numbers and everything, just focus on something artistic. Creative outlets are really important mm -hmm. when yeah. you're a science student. Like this TV show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys want to bring it home with another set of questions? Yes. Let's do it. All right. Uh, you guys are all tied right now. Great. So oh. this is the, <laughs> as far as my counting can go, because apparently I can't count higher than three. You guys all have three points right now. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. All right. I'm pretty sure I've asked more than nine questions, but that's okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with number 11. A new prime number was discovered. How long is it? Mm. Hint, it's like in the millions. So just answer something million. Yes. 12 million. More than that. Wow. 50 million. Less than that. <laughs> so we're going to play this game now. 38 million. Less than that. 24 million. I'll give it to you. 25 million. Okay. Uh, actually, it's, it's a little under 25 million, so you're pretty good there. Um, yeah, it's 1.5 million digits longer than the last prime number they discovered. And basically, there's this program that you can download onto your computer, and it'll just run in the background looking for prime numbers. And if your computer discovers the next big prime number that they haven't found before, you get $3,000. Cool. Hmm. Cool. Let's nice. do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure my laptop can handle it. Yeah. 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 Like, my laptop has issues just trying to run, like, antivirus stuff. Like, I doubt it's going to be able to crunch out a <laughs> big number. Yeah. But, like, $3,000 to do, like, no essentially nothing is a pretty good deal. Passive income, kind of? Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, next question. The U.S. has had the most Summer Olympic gold medals and Nobel Prizes combined. Woo, go us. What country is second on the list? So combined U.S. or no, sorry, combined Olympic, it says summer specifically, summer Olympic gold medals and Nobel Prizes. So who has the brawn and the brains? After us, obviously. Russia? It is not Russia. Okay. It's a good guess, though. Chloe? Sweden. It's not Sweden. China? It's not China. Oh. It's in Europe. I'll give you, I'll narrow it down okay. to that. France. Not France. You're getting closer. Germany. It is Germany. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. I'd be interesting, interested to see kind of the breakdown in categories for mm -hmm. like yeah. what were the gold medals and what were the Nobel Prizes mm -hmm. in. All right, this might be our last question. We might have time for one or two more. All right, in 2016, Google's artificial intelligence program beat the number one player of what strategy game? Go. <laughs> no, I didn't say it first. Wow, I don't know that one. We all got that point. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll give you guys all a point for that. Yeah, in case you guys couldn't hear over the The game was Go, which is an uh, ancient Chinese strategy game. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people, when they hear this question, they think it's chess. But actually, Go is far more complicated in terms of AI than chess is, just mostly because there's more uh, more choices and more mm. computational outputs that you could do. Mm. All right. Cool. I think we have oh, we have 30 seconds left, so... I think we all tied, because Jordan got that last one. Mm -hmm. I got the last one, and me... Yeah, you guys all tied. <laughs> all right, congratulations. So I guess you guys are all stuck coming back next time. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> next time, yeah. Well, let us know how, you guys, how this was. Uh, we'll be uploading this to our YouTube account that we're all going to be starting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're going to start one for this. Cool. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. And thank you to Chloe, Jordan, Mason for putting up with all the questions and have a